Today it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jay Turner, an Associate Professor of Environmental Studies here at Wellesley College. Trained as a historian, Dr. Turner has focused his career on the recent history of U.S. environmental politics and policy, including topics such as public lands, technology, and climate change. He holds a BS from Washington University in St. Louis, an AM in American Civilization from Brown University, a PhD in History from Princeton University, and a Certificate in Science, Technology, and Environmental Policy from the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs, also at Princeton. Most recently, Dr. Turner has researched the environmental history of batteries and the role of technological innovation in environmental sustainability. In 2012, he published his book, The Promise of Wilderness, American Environmental Politics Since 1964. His latest book, which is forthcoming in fall 2018, co-authored with Drew Eisenberg of Temple, is similar to this talk, The Republican Reversal, Conservatives in the Environment from Reagan to Trump. At Wellesley, Dr. Turner has taught courses on the cultures of environmentalism, climate change, and sustainability, among other topics. Additionally, he chaired Wellesley's Committee on Environmental Sustainability from 2013 to 2016, which put in place the college's current greenhouse gas reduction goals as part of the first college-wide sustainability plan. Outside of Wellesley, Dr. Turner has been active on many environmental issues, including in his own community, leading the 2015-2016 Solarize Native Campaign, a volunteer-led solar initiative. So without further ado, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Professor Jay Turner. Good morning. Kate, thank you for that introduction. Kate's an alum of ES 102, the Intro to Environmental Studies class that focuses on climate change. And I see some other alums from ES 102, which is exciting for me. Also see Maddie back there from ES 299 and lots of other people. So good morning. It's great to be here at the Albright Institute. Great to see all of you all. It's, um, you know, Joanne was saying, well, you're on leave and you came in to give an Albright talk, but it's a real pleasure and an honor to have the chance to talk with you all. So I am happy to be here. Um, I thought I would start off today with a little bit of a pop quiz. Um, and so I've been writing about environmental politics a lot recently. And I thought I'd ask, you know, who has led on environmental reform? So hopefully you've had a chance to look at these questions a little bit. Who's, who established the EPA? Who signed the Endangered Species Act into law? Who described himself as the environmental president on the campaign trail? Who signed the first global atmospheric environmental treaty? So, how about the EPA? Who established the EPA? Yeah. Richard Nixon. Richard Nixon. Outstanding. How about who signed the Endangered Species Act into law? It was 1973. It was also Nixon. There's a pattern here. Who described himself as the environmental president? It was George H.W. Bush back in 1989. Who signed the first global atmospheric environmental treaty? Ronald Reagan in 1987. So the point that I want to start with is that the Republicans, when you look back historically, have a long tradition of environmental leadership that through the 1980s, they claimed as their own. They took much pride in and they worked with Democrats to put in place the modern environmental regulatory state. But of course, in recent decades, right, Republicans have become known for their opposition to environmental reform. This is a change in their politics that started in the 1980s, accelerated into the 1990s, and into the 21st century, and has really culminated with the Trump administration over the past year. The Trump administration has taken steps to roll back the scope of the Clean Water Act, right, which protects public waters from pollution and degradation, national monument designations on public lands, most of which are located in the West, Anybody from the West, Utah, Nevada, California, states like that, right? This is where public lands debates loom largest. They've disbanded the EPA office, released its leadership that was put in place to address issues of environmental justice and has, has drawn much attention. They've also rolled back both domestic and international regulations aimed at addressing global climate change. Right? So for people who spend their time focusing on environmental politics and policy, this past year has been a very busy and disheartening year. And I've occupied myself writing a book, trying to take what's happening with the Trump administration and set it in historical context. Because although what the Trump administration is pursuing is in many ways unprecedented, 
it is the culmination of Republican efforts since the 1990s to undo our environmental laws. And so I co-authored this book with Andrew Eisenberg, and we just turned it into Harvard University Press right at the end of last year, and it's meant to come out um, hopefully summer, fall of this coming year. And it's a book that focuses on three kind of big topics, chapters two, three, and four. This is the table of contents from the uh, book manuscript. The second chapter is on public lands and uh, natural resources, it's visions of abundance. Uh, the third chapter focuses on questions of clean air and clean water and protecting public health. And then the fourth chapter focuses on climate change and climate policy, so American exceptionalism in a warming world. And it's a book about how, you know, there's good reason to be concerned right now, but also how environmentalists and other public interest advocates have mobilized historically during the second Bush administration, during the contract with America in the mid-1990s to protect our environmental laws and to protect public health. And so while there are many things the Trump administration is trying right now, there are also many people who are working and as history has shown us, will succeed in, in some cases in blocking these efforts to undo our environmental protections. So today, I want to focus on this kind of fourth chapter, this topic of climate change, the Trump administration, the Republican reversal, and how that plays into global um, climate governance. So here's a general outline for the next uh, 70 minutes. Start off with a little bit about climate change basics, talk about uncertainties, ethics, and climate justice finished with Trump and the Paris Accord. My hope is that these first four topics will take 30 or 35 minutes. Then, I've given you this handout, and you can have a look at it as we go along, but there are eight panels there, all of which raise different questions and topics, present some different data, and I figured I'll give you a little bit of time in small groups to look at this handout, talk about what interests you, what charts um, don't quite make sense, maybe need more explanation, or maybe it sparks an idea, something you would like to discuss further, and then we'll take the second half of my time with you to have a conversation, some question and answer organized around these panels or other topics that you're uh, interested in discussing that relate to climate and environment and policy. Um, so that's the game plan. So let me start off with climate change basics. As I expect many of you, all of you have heard, climate scientists hold a high level of confidence that humans are changing the climate. And to, you, know, you can go and look at the web pages, the policy statements of all the major scientific organizations in the United States and abroad and see statements like this from the American Association for the Advancement of Science that the scientific evidence is clear, right? That's from 2006. The American Chemical Society, that climate change is potentially a very serious problem. The American Geophysical Union, that climate change demands urgent action. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which was formed in the late 1980s to assemble the state of the scientific knowledge around climate change and puts out reports every five years and does this on an international basis, in 2014 released its last report. Every one of these reports has been more urgent, more concerning about climate change, and it stated, warming of the climate system is unequivocal. And at the bottom there, recent climate changes have had widespread impacts on human and natural systems already. So the point I'm making here is that you know, this statement that climate scientists are in agreement is backed up not just by new research or new evidence, but you know, since the early 2000s, climate scientists have been very confident. The most recent uh, presentation of this came in November 2017. It was actually the Trump administration that replace, uh, released the most recent report of the U.S. Climate Science Committee. And just you know, one more time to grab a couple of the highlights here, they report that this period, the 20th century up until present, is now the warmest in the history of modern civilization. Coming down to the second paragraph, it's extremely like, likely that human activities, especially emissions of greenhouse gases, are the dominant cause of the observed warming since the mid-20th century. So scientists are very confident that the climate is changing and that people are responsible for this. How is it that scientists are so confident in this assessment? So let's take 10 minutes to talk about that 
or go through um, that question. And it's useful to think about the ways we generate knowledge about the world around us. So we can think about inductive reasoning, right, starting with observation and generalizing based on those observations. Deductive reasoning, starting with first principles and theories and then looking um, and understanding how they help us explain the world. Falsification, right, trying to prove false, things that we believe are associated, related to one another, and I'll come back to consilience at the end. But each of these ways of generating knowledge about the natural world has played an important role in explaining this growing consensus around climate change. So to start off with inductive, right, we have long-term data sets that lead us to believe that the climate is changing and that we're changing the composition of the atmosphere. Right, one in this graph shows us the 20th century from 1880 up to 2020 on the bottom, and then the temperature anomaly, how much temperatures change from a long-term average there on the y-axis. And what you can see is that it shows this not steady but progressive climb in temperatures over the course of the 20th century. We've, temperatures have increased about one and a half degrees Fahrenheit during that time period from the start of the 20th century up until the last couple of years. We also know that greenhouse gases are accumulating in the atmosphere and their concentrations are growing. And so this graph shows time on the bottom, 1960 up to 2015, and then it shows the concentration of carbon dioxide there on the y-axis. And again, right, we see a much steadier climb here and the increase in greenhouse gas emissions, carbon dioxide during this time. The historic baseline kind of pre-industrial CO2 levels were about 280 parts per million, right? We're now over 400 parts per million. So you know, based on inductive reasoning, taking these long-term data sets, generalizing from these observations, it suggests that there may be a relationship between these two data sets, but clearly not a one-to-one -one relationship. So inductive reasoning is important here. Deductive reasoning is also important, right? Starting with first principles theories of how, in this case, electromagnetic radiation and molecules in the atmosphere, greenhouse gases, interact. In the 19th century, scientists first developed theories based on their understanding of the basic chemistry uh, and physical properties of these molecules that suggested that if we add greenhouse gases to the atmosphere, we would warm the planet specifically because molecules like carbon dioxide and methane and water vapor all absorb and re-release heat. So instead of letting it go out into space, they re-radiate that radiation back down to the planet, you know, in effect putting a blanket over the planet. And scientists you know, warned in the 19th century that this could be the case in the 20th century. And of course, we've seen much evidence that suggests that their um, warnings were correct. So falsification, right? Scientists could be right that the climate is warming, uh, but they might be wrong about the reasons. Can we find evidence or theories to invalidate their hypotheses, their, their reasoning? You know, scientists by nature are skeptics, right? You make a name for yourself as a scientist if you can find new evidence, if you can challenge a paradigm that is in place. Climate change science has also been scrutinized by climate skeptics, right, who have reason to doubt the science for economic or for other reasons. And so there are many efforts to falsify climate sciences, science, and questions have been raised. You know, could it be the sun? Could it be changes in the property of the sun that are driving the changes we're seeing in the climate? Could it be that the models that scientists use to project forward, that those scientists are somehow faulty? or unreliable. You know, we know that scientists have made mistakes in the past and about big questions. In the 1970s, there were some scientists who were raising the possibility that we could be going back into an ice age. And so there have been many efforts to falsify this scientific consensus, both by people within the scientific community, but then also skeptics. And none of them have been successful to date. And so one last approach to generating knowledge, this idea of consilience, which is looking for how multiple lines of independent evidence come together, and kind of like how a lawyer 
builds a case that they're going to try in court. Things must hold together in a consistent story. And when you look across a wide range of data, what you can see is if you look at sea levels, right? Sea levels are increasing and have been increasing as water warms, it expands, and the seas rise. You can look at the surface temperature of large lakes, lakes like Lake Baikal in Siberia. This data set shows an upward trend in the temperature of Lake Baikal. And this is data, it's just worth noting, that was collected by, in part by Wellesley College students who participated in the Lake Baikal program, which um, Marianne Moore and Tom Hodge have been running for over a decade. So surface temperatures are increasing in large lakes. You can look at how ecosystems are changing, right? Bird migration patterns. Birds are staying further north as the climate warms each year, and citizen scientists have observed this and documented this. And so you can see how birds have been moving further north. Or if you go to the Arctic and you look to see when plants start to flower, it turns out that plants are flowering earlier than they were as the climate warms, right? The ocean is becoming more acidic. The sea ice in the Arctic is melting. Ocean heat content. The oceans are absorbing part of the sea. That is going up too, right? This is the argument for consilience. There are these many lines of independent evidence, and when you look at them, they all generally point in the same direction, which is that the world is warming, and that people and our activities are playing an important role in driving this. So to come back to the big question here, why are scientists so confident that climate is changing and that people are responsible? It's not that we have one computer model that says climate change is a problem or that we have one data set that shows that greenhouse gas emissions are climbing, right? We have many different lines of evidence, theories, efforts to falsify, that all suggest when you put it all together, right, we're facing a challenge with respect to climate change. There's a metaphor that I think helps bring this together, which is that if you're a climate scientist, right, all of that evidence comes together. Like We may not know all the details. There might be pieces that don't quite fit together. But the big picture of this puzzle, right, it's there. Right? You, you know, they can see this big picture. They have great confidence in that picture. And that's why they're urging us collectively to take action on climate change. And I think that notion of climate science as a puzzle is useful to contrast with another metaphor, which is one that skeptics and opponents of action on climate change often take, which is that this is a house of cards, right? And if you can find one piece of data or one theory that doesn't fit in with the larger um, scientific consensus and pull that out, right, this whole house of cards is going to come tumbling down. Right? For scientists, that's not how the scientific process works. It doesn't hinge on one thing. Right? It hinges on that big picture and putting together these many different pieces into the best puzzle we can to help understand the world around us. So moving from some of just the basics of science and our confidence, uh, let's talk about what we don't know. What are uncertainties with respect to climate change? So one big one is we know that projections, projections indicate that we're going to be seeing a warmer world, right? So if you look at this graph, the questions it's asking is, we see a warmer world and the average temperature goes up. Is the distribution of events, of temperature events, are they going to say the same? Or will the variability of them change? And this is an area where there's a lot of uncertainty in the science. And it you know, kind of depends on which particular topic you're looking at, whether it's temperature or precipitation events or things like hurricanes. Um, but the question I want this slide to raise is that we may not just see a change in the mean of events, but we may also see a change in the variability, which could mean more extreme events. And you know, there are good reasons to be concerned about this, right? Looking at the hurricanes that we've seen in the Caribbean, or the fire events that we've seen in Southern California, or flooding events um, in Bangladesh and around the world. So, but it's very hard to predict, you know, to what extent it's just going to be a change in the mean and to what extent we could see changes in variability. So, you know, that's an uncertainty, and right, knowing how many more extreme events we're gonna face is a great societal um, consequence. Another uncertainty is when might we trigger some flipping point or turning point in the climate system, 
Right? If you think back to that graph I showed you of climbing carbon dioxide concentrations, right, that's a nice linear, incremental, slow, gradual increase. But what if there was a big jump in one of our Earth systems? And one place that seems most likely to go through this kind of you know, flipping point, turning point, is in the Arctic. So this is just a satellite image of the Arctic ice pack from September 16, 2002. And it's showing the yellow line, which is the average ice pack uh, over the past 30 years before that, with the extent of the Arctic ice pack in September 2012 when it reached its minimum. And you know, it's this kind of data that alarms scientists because the Arctic ice pack has been shrinking. And to put this in terms of a chart, what this chart is showing is over the course of a year, the extent of Arctic sea ice. And so you can see that in the late summer, right, it reaches its minimum and it reaches its peak um, just in another month or so when the cold is most intense in the Arctic. Now this is the average um, from 1980 to 2000 that you're seeing in that red line on the screen with two standard deviations plotted from during that period on either side. So a, a range, right, two standard deviations that should capture about 95% of the variability. But if we start layering on where the Arctic ice uh, pack extent has been over the last several years, what we see is that almost all of the minimums have been outside of that band, which reflects just how much warming has been happening in the Arctic. And something that was really, when I first started teaching climate um, 10, 12 years ago, scientists weren't ready to say that we would see the Arctic sea ice pack disappear in the 20th, 21st century, maybe at the end of the 21st century. Now scientists are warning that we may see the Arctic sea ice disappear, have a largely ice-free Arctic by 2030 mid-2030s. And this is important because the Arctic plays a key role in governing you know, many of the weather phenomenon that we experience on a month-to-month -month basis. But the Arctic is also special because once you lose the sea ice, right, white ice is reflective, right? It reflects lots of radiation back out to space, right? If you put your hand on a white car in a parking lot, right, it's going to feel a lot cooler than that black car right beside it. But as soon as that ice melts, it goes from being a white car to being a black car that absorbs a lot more radiation, which then amplifies this process of warming. And so it will exacerbate the climbing. And it could take us from that incremental climb to a big jump, big changes in our climate system. So this is another big uncertainty. When? When are we going to lose the Arctic sea ice? Is there anything we can do to try and stop that from happening? The biggest uncertainty, though, is us, right? What are we going to do? How are we going to change our behavior? How are we going to change our energy systems? Are we going to have an energy transition, which is one of the topics for your talk um, next Thursday? And the IPCC, the organization that synthesizes all of this climate information, has scenarios that they use where they go from now and they assume we don't make many changes or we make substantial changes. And that can lead to a vast range of potential greenhouse gas emissions um, going out through the 21st century. And so in many ways, right, projecting what we're going to do is much harder than understanding the basic physical systems that govern um, our atmosphere and our climate. So this is the largest variable in the Earth climate system. It's us and the decisions we make. So just to wrap up um, these uncertainties, scientists are making projections about how the world is going to change over the course of the 21st century. The best estimates, and these are drawn from the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, is that based on kind of our current commitments um, in terms of trying to slow down climate change, we're still facing warming that's somewhere in the neighborhood of three and a half degrees Celsius over the course of the 21st century, which would drive up sea levels at least 40 to 65 centimeters. And so just an excerpt, they say, surface temperatures projected to rise over the 21st century under all assessed emission scenarios. It's very likely that heat waves will occur more often and last longer, and that extreme precipitation events will become more intense and frequent in many regions. The ocean will continue to warm and acidify and global mean sea level to rise. 
So for those of you who are working on projects that intersect with issues of climate, really good resources for you for getting um, information are the publications of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the Fifth Assessment Report, but also the recently released Climate Science Special Report, which is the fourth national climate assessment, which represents you know, the best synthesis that U.S. scientists have put together, which came out um, in November of 2017. So, you know, talk about climate. You talk about, you know, how many greenhouse gas emissions, how many parts per million, you know, what's the temperature anomaly, what's the, you know, degrees Celsius change. What is that in Fahrenheit anyways, right? But this is about people, right? This is a humanitarian issue. This is an issue that is going to affect generations going forward in ways that are going to change people's everyday lives. They're going to put them in the path of natural disasters that could have been avoided, that's going to make development harder for them. And so remembering that we're not just talking about greenhouse gas emissions, we're not just talking about numbers, we're talking about issues of justice and ethics is really crucial. And so climate justice is an important part of thinking about climate change and its impacts. And just to put a definition up here, the communities most affected by the causes and consequences of climate change are least responsible for the problem. These disproportionately include the poor, people of color, and indigenous communities in developed and developing countries. Now, Part of this is about the impacts of climate change, right? The people who've been using the fewest fossil fuels are the ones who are going to bear the impacts of a changing climate. They're disproportionately exposed to the consequences. And you know, we've seen this in places like Houston or New Orleans. We've seen, um, and we have good reason to be concerned about people who are living on low-lying atoll countries in the Pacific. Um, countries like Mauritius, this is Mauritius's president signing underwater uh, declaration of uh, protest to uh, go to the international climate negotiation saying you need to protect my nation which is at risk because it's going to be inundated by sea level rise or you know, people fighting flooding, dealing with catastrophic flooding in developing countries in Asia. You know, all of these are communities that are on the front lines of climate change impacts. But it's also a matter of those who are disproportionately exposed to the consequences of fossil fuel extraction, right? It's not just that people in wealthier countries are burning more fossil fuels. In many cases, those fossil fuels are being sourced from developing countries or disadvantaged communities in developed countries. You know, so this has been front page news with the Dakota Access Pipeline protests over the last two years and the threat that's posed to native communities in North Dakota. Historically, Oil extraction in countries like Ecuador has had devastating effects for indigenous people living in um, the Amazon. There's a movie called Crude, which um, shown a spotlight on this about 10 years ago. Um, and Nigeria has been a major source of petroleum, both for Europe and for the United States. Historically, much of that oil has been extracted from Agoni land uh, to the disadvantage of the Agoni people who have lived in tried to protest the conditions that have resulted from oil extraction with limited success. So when we're talking about climate justice, we're talking both about those who are being affected by the consequences of climate change, but also sourcing the fossil fuels that are driving the problem in the first place. The, uh, if you're looking, if this connects with any of your presentations, kind of for a synthesis of this, the University of Notre Dame has a global adaptation index which summarizes the vulnerability of communities to climate change. And red is worse on this graph. And as you can see, nations in Africa and some in Asia and then in Latin America are the ones that are least well prepared for adapting to the changes in climate that they're going to be experiencing. And it's worth just pairing that with a graph showing who it is. It's causing climate change, who's been responsible for burning the most fossil fuels historically, which of course is concentrated in North America and Europe and parts of the global north. So that brings us to Trump and some recent events in the Paris Accord. So addressing climate change is clearly difficult and I've got some specific thoughts on that, but just you know, I think something that often goes under acknowledged is part of the reason 
and it's obvious that climate change is so difficult to address, is because just how important fossil fuels have been to us as a society, the United States as a country, to the developed world, and uh, the world as a whole in terms of improving the quality of life, making things possible that would not have been possible without such a concentrated source of energy that we could draw upon. So what this graph shows is, you know, since the start of the 20th century, right, the dramatic shift away from biomass, away from wood, towards fossil fuels like coal and petroleum and natural gas. And so clearly the composition of energy consumption in the U.S. has changed, which is mirrored by most other developed countries, but also the amount of energy that we've used has also changed, right? It's grown dramatically since the start of the 20th century with you know, tremendous growth in coal and natural gas and petroleum fossil fuels that are responsible for the greenhouse gas emissions that are causing climate change. So you know, we made a bargain, right, with these fossil fuels at the start of the 20th century. And it's a bargain that has brought much wealth and much development and improved quality of life for many people, but it is a bargain that it also has meant that we have started to change the climate in ways that will affect this planet for not just you know, generations, but for thousands of years to come. So that's part of the reason climate is hard to solve. It's hard to get out of this bargain that we've made. But there's some more structural issues that I think are worth being mindful of in the context of the Albright Institute, because I think they're structural issues that probably appear in other um, challenges that you all are addressing. You know, this is a kind of, you know, perfect example, right, of the tragedy of the commons, where each person gains by using fossil fuels, right, but they're spreading the costs of using those resources, the greenhouse gas emissions, the changes to the climate, across a much, you know, across the rest of society. So the shared resource benefits the individual, but at the expense of the common good. This is also an intergenerational challenge, right? We gain from using these fossil fuels now. We are seeing some consequences of climate change in the world around us today, but the bulk of the benefits of changing our energy infrastructure right, will be realized in generations to come. And so this is an intergenerational problem, and structurally that makes us hard to solve as well. This is an also an issue where externalities are important because there's a market price on fossil fuels, and it is a market price that's based on extracting the resource, transporting the resource, advertising the resource, uh, but it's not a market price that factors in the social cost, whether it's the long-term cost of climate change or the short-term cost of increased air pollution that could degrade people's health. And so when we're talking about climate change, understanding these externalities, these social and environmental costs that are not priced into the market um, price, into the exchange, is important as well. And so all of these help explain why climate change is hard to solve. We could have a much longer list if we wanted to. But I want to shift gears and emphasize that there has been a long-standing concerted effort to address climate change. And the kind of kickoff, if you're looking for one, came in 1992 when the world community came together under the auspices of the United Nations and signed the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. And what it did was establish a framework for negotiating commitments to addressing climate change going forward with the goal, and I've highlighted the kind of most important sentence here, of preventing dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate system. So that was the goal that the 180, 90 countries that signed on to this framework convention agreed to trying to achieve. And that became the catalyst for negotiations, some of which I expect you've heard of, that started in the early 1990s and have continued to present. Um, Kyoto drew a lot of attention for an early agreement there. There was a lot of hope in Copenhagen in 2015 at the start of the Obama administration. But it was this series of negotiations that led up to the Paris Agreement in December 2015, when for the first time, both developed and developing countries came together to make commitments to addressing climate change. 
So what was on the table in Paris and why has this event been so important? On the table was the goal of taking that notion of preventing dangerous interference and you know, actually putting some you know, number to that. And the number that was agreed to was that if we could hold that change in average temperatures to 1.5 degrees Celsius, that would constitute avoiding dangerous interference in the climate system. Ideally, um, yeah, so stop there. Uh, on the table too, for the first time, was getting both developed and developing countries to make a commitment. I mean, arguably, that didn't make any sense at all, right? Because it's countries like the United States and the Soviet Union and um, the European countries that have burned the most fossil fuels that really caused this problem. But for political reasons, to get a commitment in a country like the US, it was important to get developing countries to make commitments to, even if those commitments were further down the road. So this is the first time that you saw commitments by all countries, not just the developed countries, to addressing um, their emissions. And then it also included inventory and verification of greenhouse gas emissions for developing countries um, and commitments to reductions in the future. So that was what was on the table. And the outcome was that the world agreed to uh, try and hold temperature to a two degree Celsius increase. 1.5 was deemed just unworkable. Commitments by both developed and developing countries were made. A pledge and review approach was put into place. And this is important because Paris was not binding. It didn't tell any country what it had to do. Each country chose its own pledge, which would be reviewed. But what made sense for the United States or for Tanzania or um, Nicaragua, which recently joined the agreement? So this pledge and review approach that preserved national autonomy. And ultimately, it was non-binding. It was a formal commitment, but not a binding commitment. And the commitments that were made didn't actually get us to that two degree C goal. The assumption was that more commitments that would be made in the future um, would help us realize the goal. So that's the out, uh, on the table and the outcome and it was the Obama administration which played a key role in ushering in the Paris Climate Accord in partnership with other countries, um, China in particular, on the global stage. And it was this agreement that on June 1st, President Trump pulled us out of. Now, it's worth, you know, nobody was surprised, right, when Trump did that. It was something that he had been promising to do as a key part of his um, campaign. But from a longer view, from a historian's view, it was surprising, right? Because it was George H.W. Bush who signed the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change and helped negotiate it in 1992. And so there was a time right, when historically Republicans viewed environmental issues with a sense of urgency that demanded action, that they put faith in scientific research and professional expertise. They embraced an essential role for government in regulating business and industry, right? They were committed to addressing environmental issues. And this had started to falter in the 1980s. Reagan was no friend to the environment on domestic issues, but this model of Republican concern, kind of one of the great examples of it is the actions that the Reagan administration pushed on the international stage to address the ozone hole which became a pressing environmental concern in the 1980s. And it was the Reagan administration that played a key role in negotiating the, negotiating the Montreal Protocol of 1987, which put into place restrictions on uh, industrial pollutants that degraded the ozone hole, the stratospheric ozone hole. So the Reagan administration you know, could claim credit and did claim credit for addressing this issue, which was based on scientific research, right? It, this was scientists were saying that emissions of these chlorofluorocarbons in amounts that would add up to parts per billion, kind of concentrations in the stratosphere, that minute amount of pollutant could pose a threat to the welfare of the planet. And therefore, we need to take action. And so based on that, the Reagan administration led this campaign. And for many people, the Montreal Protocol was seen as a template for how to address climate change as well. And it was a template that Republicans helped to put into place. But since the 1990s, the Republican Party has increasingly distanced itself 
from environmental regulations. We can have a longer, longer conversation about why this is the case. Um, part of it is that the nature of environmental issues have changed, right? Climate seems much more abstract and global and distant from the US than do things like polluted rivers that catch on fire or smog days in Los Angeles that last for weeks. And so without that urgency, Republicans have been less concerned about taking action. Since the 1970s, business interests have been much more effectively organized on domestic regulation issues. And although business often supported environmental regulations in the 1970s, by the 1980s and the 1990s, they realized just how stringent those regulations were, what kind of impact they had on their operations. And so business interests, corporate interests have been much more effective at mobilizing and partnering, particularly with the Republican Party, to block environmental regulations. And Republicans, you know, since the 1990s, have become especially good at harnessing not just um, questions about science or business interests, but building grassroots opposition to environmental protection as well. And this is something that Trump has really uh, excelled at with his America First populism, kind of harnessing that and anti-environmentalism, uh, particularly around climate change together. So you know, since the 1990s, Republicans have increasingly viewed environmental issues as exaggerated and alarmist. They've cast doubt on scientific research and dismissed professional expertise and viewed environmental regulations as unnecessary burdens on the economy and threats to an individual freedom and free enterprise. So in this book that I've been working on, I mean, we argue that this Republican reversal is one of the most dramatic shifts and domestic politics of the 20th century because the Republican Party really went from being a key player, key stakeholder in this bipartisan effort to lay the groundwork for protecting our environment to in the last decade really become you know, a clear antagonist to this effort to address public and environmental welfare. So it's a dramatic shift and you know, the culmination of it in many ways came with Trump in the Paris Accord on June 1st when he pulled out. And it's worth noting then when Trump did this, it was not about the science. He hardly addressed the science. He didn't call into question the science of climate change at all when he stood at the lectern that day. Instead, he focused on values, on conservative values, and he emphasized that the agreement was just unfair to the United States. It penalized the United States and favored developing countries such as China and India. He argued that it was an onerous agreement that didn't actually impact climate address global warming in any meaningful way, so it was inconsequential. And he cast doubt on the role of government and these kinds of international agreements and actually productively addressing these problems because in his view, the free market could address in technological innovation, right? That was the way that you could solve these problems by getting the government out of it, not engaging the government in these kinds of commitments and regulations. And so, you know, think back to 1992 and this progressive set of negotiations that finally led to Paris, right? It finally seemed that the world had come together with a plan to take significant steps towards addressing climate change. And the Trump administration really, you know, has fundamentally changed international environmental governance by pulling us out of the Paris Climate Accord. And so I'll stop there and we can discuss and have questions. And what I want to do is turn to that handout that I gave you, because there are a bunch of different ways we could go with our conversation. 